The fretless bass. Why? I think of fretless bass as a halfway point between a regular fretted electric bass and an upright. The lack of frets allows the player to slide, use vibrato, and add a bit of the uh, pitch uncertainty characteristic of an upright. The direct contact between the string and the wood of the fingerboard gives notes a bloom, that characteristic moi sound many players strive for. But the fretless bass also has its own unique character, apart from both of those instruments. Players like Jaco Pastorius and Mick Karn owe their signature sounds to the fretless bass. I've owned a few fretless basses over the years. From the translucent orange Ernie Ball Music Man Stingray I played with my bands in Atlanta in the early 2000s, to the Squire Vintage Modified Jazz Bass I used in the late 2010s, to my Frankenstein fretless, made from the body of a Daphne Blue Squire Classic Vibe Jazz Bass, and a stock Fender fretless neck with DiMarzio pickups. I loved the looks and the sound of that Frankenstein bass, but I knew the horrors that lurked beneath the surface, and eventually last year I decided to let it go. But then I looked back and realized that while I rarely played it live, I recorded with it a lot, so I probably do need a fretless bass in my life. That led me to the fretless Fender Player Jazz Bass I reviewed a few months ago. That bass, like most of Fender's recent output, kind of sucked. So I returned it. Ever since then, I've been waiting for Sweetwater to get this bass in stock. The G&L Tribute Kiloton Fretless Bass. At the end of December, they got one, one, in stock, and I snagged it. Here it is. I have to take a moment to talk about fret lines. This is a contentious issue. I'm not proud. I will admit, it is more impressive to see a bassist playing a fretless bass with that smooth, undifferentiated expanse of wood on the fingerboard. But guess what? I'm not trained on this instrument. I'm not a full-time performing musician. I have not had the time or opportunity to develop the requisite muscle memory. Fret lines do not change how the fretless bass sounds, except in one key way. With lines, I have a reasonable chance of playing notes roughly in tune. Since that does matter, even with the nuances of a fretless bass, an unlined neck is not an option for me. Period. Okay, let's move on. Unboxing. While I would have preferred a gig bag, this bass arrived securely triple boxed, which is good considering the tendency of FedEx to, well, mistreat boxes. GNL had already double boxed it, and of course Sweetwater always adds another box with their uh, unique foam padding. And of course, candy. Sweet. Get it? Sweet? Sweetwater? Ugh. Inside the box, uh, boxes, things were pretty straightforward. The base in a foam bag, plus some hex tools. Three hex tools, instead of the usual two for the truss rod and bridge saddles. Because, the Kiloton's unique pickup has individually adjustable pole pieces, which use their own extra small hex tool. More on that later. First looks. GNL Tribute Series instruments are manufactured in Indonesia. Four of the five bases I presently own were made in Indonesia. Yes, I have a problem. But one is for sale on eBay right now. Link in the description. I'm not sure if they were all made by Court or possibly by another factory, but I find Indonesian-made instruments to be of consistently high quality at modest prices. At $700, this is one of the more expensive Indonesian instruments, but everything about it is well done. I love the satin finish on the back of the neck. It allows your left hand to move smoothly, even if it gets sweaty, and mine does, especially on stage. The edges of the fingerboard are gently rolled, much better than the edges of the Fender Player, which not only were sharp angles, but were actually a bit jagged in spots due to excess polyurethane. The G&L High Mass Bridge is a thing of beauty. You can really see with certain elements of G&L instruments how they are a natural evolution of Leo Fender's design innovations, from the Fender Precision and Jazz to Music Man, and finally G&L. The same goes for the pickup. Again, more on that later. But I'm not a fan of the precision style knobs. I like knobs with numbers, or at least some kind of markings on them, so I can glance down and see how far they're turned. Fortunately, I had some Gibson style push-on speed knobs in my bag of knobs. Wait, doesn't everyone just have a bag of guitar knobs lying in a drawer somewhere? Those knobs fit perfectly as replacements. I even think they complement the look of the sunburst body and tortoise shell pick guard better than the stock knobs. The body. 
I know from my past videos that people are always desperate for this bit of information. According to Sweetwater, the space weighs a modest 9 pounds 3 ounces. I've heard that some earlier GNL instruments weighed upwards of 11 pounds, and weight is one of the main reasons I sold both of the Music Man Stingrays I used to own. I'm not sure what wood the body is made from. Sweetwater says it's ash. I don't recognize wood grain on site, but I get the feeling this is something else. Last year, Low End Lobster did a review of this bass, link below, and his looked a lot different from mine. He said his had a poplar body with an ash top. Mine looks more like poplar on the front, and the back is just painted solid black, whereas on his bass, both sides had the sunburst finish. I don't love sunburst finish, but it's the only option for most fretless bases. If I'm going to see wood grain, I want it to be interesting looking wood grain, and on this base it's about as bland as it can get. That's not a deal breaker by any means though. The finish is well done, and the body looks flawless. The fingerboard. The fingerboard is another matter. There's nothing wrong with its construction. The problem is GNL's indefensible decision to ship this base with round wound strings. I'm not sure how much it got played before it was in my hands, either at the factory or during Sweetwater's 55 point inspection. All I know is that the extent of my playing of this bass with its stock rounds was for the demos in this video, and by the time I removed those strings, there was already a lot of visible wear, especially from the E string. It's a matter of personal preference whether you think flats sound better than rounds or which feels better to play, but there is no question that rounds will chew up the fingerboard on a fretless, so for that reason alone, I think they should always ship pre-strung with flats. I knew from Sweetwater's photos that this bass had rounds on it, so in the same order I also got a set of Labella white nylon tape wound strings. They're my favorite. They're as smooth as flats, smoother actually, and again especially good for sweaty hands, but they have a bit more of the sonic brightness of rounds. As soon as I had finished recording my demos with the stock rounds, I put the bass on the bench, uh, if you can call it that, my studio is still a work in progress, and got to work. I removed the strings, peeled the plastic film off the pickguard, which required pulling off the very securely attached push-on knobs, oiled the fingerboard, it didn't desperately need it like some bases I've had, but I never miss the opportunity when the strings are off, and I finally restrung it with the labellas. My personal rule is always to measure and cut the string 4 inches past the midpoint of the post. That's enough to wrap the string securely around the post twice, but not leave an absurd amount of excess. Okay, that pickup. Before we get to the demos, let's talk about the pickup. It looks like a Music Man style humbucker, which makes sense considering Leo Fender designed them both. It's even in roughly the same position. But it is no ordinary humbucker. It's a magnetic field design pickup, MFD for short. That's GNL's marketing language, but what is it all about? First off, unlike the Music Man, this is a passive instrument. I've tried over the years to embrace, or even really to understand, active electronics, but ultimately I just do not think they suit me or my playing style, and I'm constantly anxious about playing an instrument that needs a battery. I haven't bothered to adjust the heights of the pole pieces, although I appreciate the attention to detail in designing a pickup where they can be individually adjusted. What I find really interesting about this pickup is the three-way toggle switch for series, split, and parallel modes. Honestly, I don't really understand the difference, and GNL doesn't provide much explanation on their website. Watch Lobster's video for more details, but I'll tell you how it works in my brain. I think of series, with the switch towards the neck, as Music Man mode, split, with the switch in the middle, as Precision mode, and parallel, with the switch towards the bridge, as Jazz mode, specifically the bridge pickup on a jazz bass. I don't know if that thinking is really accurate in any way, but it helps me to think about which type of sound I'm going for. Now let's hear how it sounds. First with the stock round wound strings, then with the Labella white nylon tapes. Tone demos. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Final thoughts. This is a really well-made bass for the money, as I've come to expect with Indonesian instruments. It looks great, sounds great, and is fun to play. But let's quantify this a bit. Pros. Excellent quality and attention to detail. Feels great to play. Sounds good, with a varied but not overwhelming number of tonal options. Cons. This run seems to use cheaper body wood than the earlier ones, as seen in Lobster's video. Precision style knobs are difficult to remove, but that's nitpicking. Should not ship with stock round wound strings. The last point is the only one that's a serious criticism. My advice would simply be for anyone buying this instrument to also buy a set of their preferred flats and, crucially, install them before playing it at all. Other than that, this is a great fretless bass that I look forward to using for many years to come. Now let's wrap up with one more rendition of my tune, uh, Recrudescence of Symptomatology. Thank you. 